when the heck is an uh, astronomy teacher have to do with the history? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's your, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. I appreciate the directors and the presidents of the UPSES for receiving me. I thank you for taking your time and being here. Uh, Easter is kind of boring for many people, so I hope not too many of you end up sleeping in the middle <laughs> of the presentation. So I, I was asked to explain why an astronomer or astrophysicist deals with history, right? And so I'll put to melt the ice a little bit. I will start by introducing myself, my background. So the first five minutes, let's put it that way, would be just to, to try to explain that convergency or not between history and, and astronomy. And then the lecture itself about Kibrigo will start afterwards. Um, I speak fast in general. If I'm going too fast, you just tell me sub warp five and I will slow down. Uh, feel free to ask questions whenever you want. I mean, I, um, I didn't have time to totally uh, polish the presentation, so some photos are not mine. Uh, although I have my own Antarctica photos, I couldn't find it as an example. Uh, but um, I, I think it works better if I just show the documents from Kavir themselves, let the documents talk, and then you can give them a context and you can ask questions at any moment, okay? I hope I don't take more than one hour, it's late in the day, we've been working all week, so. It's up to you. I could, spend, you could stay here seven days discussing Kavrigo. Uh, by the way, I didn't want this. I, I stumbled on this document about two years ago, and I woke up my wife at three o'clock in the morning, look at what I found, <laughs> when I realized Alvin Nunes was Portuguese. The second largest ship who uh, came to discover California was, was co-owned by a Portuguese person, period. Um, there's a 95% 95 probability. Uh, 95 that he was Portuguese indeed. And I was, I wasn't, I am finishing my PhD so I said, I, I have too much to do in my life. Why me? Why now? I don't want this. So <laughs> I tried to put the documents away, but I realized uh, I couldn't do it, right? It's history. The documents must be public. People must, especially with the Spanish being particularly um, simplistic in their approach to what natural means. Natural doesn't mean being moral especially in the context of the laws of naturalization in Castile. And I give many examples in a few moments of more in my paper. If you are natural of a place, typically yes, typically natural or native, it's a synonym, right, native or natural, uh, it means you are born at, but not necessarily. So uh, Magellan is an example. Magellan was Portuguese, right? But he got naturalized Spanish. Uh, American Vespucci, right, who gave a name to America, same thing. He was, was natural. I have a letter of naturalization of American Vespucci to show in a few moments, right? João de Solis, who was the pilot major of Spain in 1512, the pilot major, right, was also naturalized Spanish. He was not born Spanish. There are so many examples, even someone like me, who's not a professional historian, when I saw what the Spanish was, this came out to me, what the heck? Simplistic, ignorant, I'm sorry, I will tell that in defense of the historians. It didn't cover basic stuff. Either you were ignorant, which is bad, this is bad scholarship. Sorry, I don't want to be non elegant but indeed this is bad scholarship. Or if you knew about this stuff and you didn't cover, then it's what? I prefer to believe it's ignorance, right? I don't want to go elsewhere, right? But either way, it doesn't look good on the people who have been pushing that Kevin was Spanish born. No documents, zero documents that Kevin was born in Spain. Say so he's natural off. And that's not necessarily being born, right? And I give many examples about that. Okay, so we'll go in, in a few moments, we'll go to the, to, the, to the talk itself. So I was born in Hotel, right in the very northeast of Portugal. That was the castle in a drawing from 1500s, but then the Spanish destroyed in the War of the Seven Years in 1762 uh, because of Uruguay mostly, right? It was Portugal and Spain were in the war uh, for about 200, 300 years, like come and go, come and go, come and go. So that's, those are the ruins of the castle now. Uh, this is a church from 1200s. Uh, my grandparents used to live nearby, they're deceased by now. I have a house up here where my mother lives as well. My daughter likes to climb up there. And so, there's a poem from a Fernando Pessoa, one of his ethnologists, Alberto Cayer in Portuguese, says something like, from the top of my village I can see as much as you can from the universe, right? So my village is full of history, but can I see the entire universe from there, right? <laughs> Maybe not, right? So that's the connection between history and astronomy. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Fernando Pessoa and Alberto Cayer. So, uh, Otelli used to be a town. Uh, it has a national monument, which is actually a, a minor basilica. My mother and my father were married here. I got baptized there, although I'm an atheist, right? But, uh, and so it has lots of history. I was born in a village with lots of history. That's where the history comes from, right? Uh, as an example, some of the examples of the captain majors of Otelli, the Otelli Castle. 
You got Rui Fernandes de Macedo in the Battle of 385. Uh, there was no Spain. Spain was much younger than Portugal. Spain was founded in 1492, right? When Castilla and Aragon got together. Portugal comes from the 12th century, 1145, around something, right? So the Castilians were trying to attack Portugal, and the, the king was on the, on the ground, he was a, a Castilian Hitler, and he was about to be killed, right? And Rui Fernandes de Macedo and another fellow from nearby Otay saved his life. And so he became the captain major of my village, right? Now, uh, a town back then. Another one's Antonio Gomes de Mena. He was the governor of Cape Verde, right? He founded Bissau, the capital of uh, Guinea Bissau, right? So he was also the captain major of my village, right? Another one is Lopez Sosa. Lopez Sosa was the father of Martin Afonso de Sosa, the first governor of Brazil. The guy who uh, uh, founded the Mel in India as well. And so on, I can give you more examples. But what I'm trying to say is that the history surrounds the village, right? So you need, you need to. And was your nostrils if you live there, right? So that's my connection with used to uh, somehow. Uh, so recently I found out this summer that this guy is my cousin in fifth degree. He killed the Portuguese king in 1908. Right? <laughs> Manuel Buisson was a Carbonari, a Republican, and they, you know, monarchies are not democratic, are they? Half European countries, unfortunately, are not that democratic in their point of view, but. Uh, well, we have, we have um, uh, well, in the US, I was, <laughs> was going to talk about Trump as well, but that was better than that. So he's, he's uh, from my uh, maternal, grand, my paternal grandmother, he's my uh, cousin in fifth degree. And uh, this is Sidoni Pais, who was a Portuguese president in 1918. He's also the uncle of my uh, paternal grandmother. Uh, although I couldn't confirm all the details, this is a cousin of mine who was the vice consul of the Portuguese Embassy in Washington. She's the one who knows more of this. I just found out about him this summer. So history is around. There, you, you have to understand history, right? Uh, in the village. And so, uh, but you cannot look into the universe from top of my village, as the poet was saying, right? So I, I needed to find telescopes elsewhere. So as an example, I was here working in the Mojave Desert when I came to California and met my wife later. I was working in a, this detector, which is the Shannon Cove Atmospheric Telescope. So basically at night collects light uh, and concepts the light in this uh, photomultipliers arrangement here, this set. Uh, basically we're trying to detect dark matter, as you know dark matter is something very important in the universe. So uh, uh, I, there are no telescopes on top of the castle of my village, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that's just one example of the things I've been doing. So this was in uh, UC Davis, mostly in the Mojave Desert. And then I moved to Germany, but at the same time I spent about one year of my life at periods of two weeks in Chile, right, in Atacama Desert. I used to sleep around there, right? I used to work mostly in this telescope. This is the place where I have dinner. But uh, what we look for are the furthest away objects in the universe, right, which are called gamma ray bursts and quasars. You see an idea, these gamma ray bursts, they, they release in one minute as much energy as the sun in its entire life. Bah! Right? Tremendous explosion. And they are known as the next bang after the big bang. That means what? They're super bright. You can see them very, 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 very far away. Right? And there's uh, something you know when you get the ticket from the police, what? Butler effect. Your car goes very fast. Bam! It goes really fast. Bam! You can tell when something goes fast, 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 fast. With light, something similar happens. And the faster the universe expands, the further away galaxies and quasars are, the red, bam, redder, redder, redder light gets, even into the infrared, right? So that's what I do with chase, or I try to do a left, right? So a couple of years ago, we had a record of the, one of the furthest away gamma ray bursts uh, at the redshift unit of Z equals 6.7, corresponds to about 95% of the age of the universe. So that's the astronomer and the personal light history, right? Again, just to give you a bit of background, uh, I understand and I appreciate skepticism. So, well, this guy is from strong, he doesn't know anything about history. I think it was uh, Einstein who said that uh, in order to survive a theory, uh, any idea must live dangerously, it must be tested, you must ask questions, you must pose hard questions, right? So those are very welcome, uh, always, right? So what we try to do, as I was saying, we want to look back as much as possible in space-time, because after the Big Bang, there were no stars or galaxies formed immediately, right? It took a while for gravity, to get together and form the first stars. There's no chicken or egg here, right? Mm -hmm. You definitely have the very first stars called the pre-galactic stars, and afterwards you have galaxies, right? So you want to see as much as possible back in time. And my team, we have a record about here. This is uh, as far as you can see. Uh, so the universe is much older than that. Right? But anyway, I don't want to bother you too much with the storm details. 
Uh, I, I just want to converge into where astronomy and history come back. So at the moment, I teach at American River College, um, uh, which is essentially boring. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's noble to teach, of course. But sometimes I try to do extra interesting projects with my students. So as an example, this is a balloon we launch. This is a, a photo taken by the, my students from, uh, I think this is Barstow, and the famous uh, Edwards Air Force Base, where the right stuff, the first US astronauts uh, trained, right? The Pacific Ocean, etc., etc. So this is about uh, 35 kilometers high. So I launched this balloon from the Mojave Delta. So a couple of my students as well in NASA uh, Fort Summers, New Mexico. This is the gondola with several experiments that we also place there. When we have time, I take my students to other telescopes, etc. So that's what I do professionally, right? Although lately, history has become also. Uh, so uh, as I was saying, mixing history and astronomy. Uh, in 2000, I, I could apply for a grant to detect new trainers, this very low mass particles in Antarctica. But I didn't want to spend there one year, so I convinced the Portuguese TV and the Portuguese Institute of Cinema to give me some money. I took a cameraman and a photographer. So I went to Palmerston, which is an amazing German icebreaker. So I slept there for about two months. And then we went to the Neumeyer station base. This, this one doesn't exist anymore. This is the old base, it's now crashed by ice. And so uh, this was the door for my first. Uh, professional achievement in history because I realized uh, the following uh, after being in Antarctica. So, uh, if you go, as I was saying, uh, about 2,200 kilometers southeast of uh, Cape, Cape of Good Hope, uh, Mary Carter, the great cartographer, uh, Flemish cartographer, uh, shows up this legend in many maps saying, <coughs> the region of the giant perch that have about three cubits tall, a cubit is half, half an hour, uh, with copious amounts, right? So the, the Portuguese and nobody else in Europe ever saw uh, this kind of penguins. They look like parrots, right? <laughs> They're colorful for people who never saw penguins. Uh, and so everyone said, no, my country is wrong. He must be confusing the land of the parrots with Brazil, right? And there are many papers from Australian professional historians say, hey, this is wrong. So I found another map from Matteo Rich, who was an astronomer, See an astronomer, uh, but he was also a sinologist, and he introduced Christianity into the Chinese court. And then the map says the Portuguese saw the land of the parents, but they didn't stop. Aha, in Brazil we stop, obviously, right? Checkmate, right? You must come out be Brazil. So I ended up publishing a couple of other things. I don't want to take too much time, and I got a grant to go to the International Conference of History of Cartography. I speak Russian as well, so at the time that helped to uh, to go there. So that's how a little bit of astronomy converted to history. And then um, I spoke with different Portuguese historians, uh, professional professors at the University of Lisbon. In particular, Professor Content Domingues, he invited me, look, once you finish your PhD in astronomy, I want you to do a master's degree in history. You don't have a degree in history, doesn't matter, I will uh, enroll you in a master's degree. Hey, fantastic, but he died. I was writing him a couple months ago to tell him, look what I found about Cabrillo. I just realized he died, unfortunately. He's, he's one of the best Portuguese historians. He wrote a book about Pacheco Pereira, which in 1498 discovered Brazil, before the official Alves Cabal in 1500, so he has a, a book about that. He also has a collection of papers about the Portuguese in Australia. I mean, the Portuguese went from Lisbon to Timor. And then you believe they spent 200 kilometers without checking Australia? They crossed over the Antipod and they stopped for the last 100 kilometers. Give me a break, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are records of the Portuguese measuring how deep was the ocean between East Timor and Australia, right? And you can see this map as an example for 1543 from the Dieppe School, the Bro School. Look at that. That's the coast of South America with the, this appendix here. <laughs> this is more or less roughly the map of 1543 when Cabrillo died. Right. Anyway, so he's an amazing fellow, unfortunately he's dead, and my invitation for the Master in Science in History, we'll see what happens. So that's to answer the question of how history and astronomy end up combining in my case, right? <coughs> so that was the introduction to melt ice, as I said, and again, feel free to ask any questions whenever you feel it's a good moment. So let's um, move. Yes, please. Uh, when did Vasco da Gama go to Brazil? Uh, in his first voyage to India, uh, he passed nearby and he told, let's celebrate because we're in front of a Portuguese land. So he knew, and he said, tell the Portuguese king to go and see the map he has there, because to the left, to the west, there's a Portuguese land. They thought it was an island like, like California for a while, they didn't know all the extension of Brazil. And there were some cosmographers and some physicists who told, yeah, this is the land of Portugal. But I don't think Vasco da Gama, uh, Pedro Alves Cabral, Alves Cabral went in the second armada to India, 
is the first European seller to, to land in four continents, Europe, South America, Africa, and Asia, right? Alves Cabral is, is the one who officially discovers Brazil. Right? So Vasco da Gama, I'm not sure if he ever stopped in Brazil. If he did, it was just briefly, but that was never his goal. We could discuss end topics about Portuguese history. By the way, Mr. Benayas, when he did a speech uh, this summer, in September, he mentioned that uh, some fellows went to Portugal, look at the Portuguese record, they didn't find anything about Cabrillo. Duh. Right? Because Cabrillo didn't work for the Portuguese crown. So obviously he would not find information about the common citizen in, in, the, in the Portuguese uh, archives. But he, he looked in the wrong place. He should have looked in the regional archives. Right? There are records of a Rodrigues family in the north of Portugal. There's a crucifix. So uh, you have to know where to look. Right? Don't look for someone who works for the Portuguese crown in the Portuguese archives, national archives. Look for a common citizen. Right? <coughs> so now, as I always say, let's move then into the Cabrillo part of this talk. Um, so this is the, the Relacion, right? the report of the voyage of Cabrillo, written by John Pius. It belongs to the Archives of India in Sevilla, AGI. And uh, this is the only statement that says that Bartolome Ferrell, uh, it's Ferrell, but uh, you know, it's easy to misspell uh, uh, names. I also butcher the English sometimes, I apologize for that. It says, his natural, live tissue from the Levant, from the part of the rising sun. But what, what does that mean? Is it from the Mediterranean? Is it from the Mediterranean of Spain? Is it from Italy? Is it from Greece? Is it from the Middle East? That was it. The sky says, he's Spanish. He was born in Spain. That's it. That's all the information they have to state that the Spanish give me a break. That's not serious. Uh, and look how serious it's not. This is from 1543, right? Um, and so, if you go to the web page of the Royal Academy of History of Spain, which I think it has some responsibility, they say Bartolomeu Ferrer is born in Bilbao in the Basque country. Why? Where is that documented? Show me documents. I contacted Professor William Douglas from the University of Rio in Nevada. He has an amazing book about the Basques exploring the Pacific Ocean. So there is no information at all about Ferrer. What? But that's what the Royal Academy of Spain said. If you read the Journal of History from San Diego, it says that Ferrer is born in Valencia. Why? Is it Valencia? Is it Bilbao? Is it? Give me a break. Show me documents, right? Okay, let me show you a document. His testament. His testament from 1547. I found it in the Peru National Archives. That's the signature of Bartolomé Ferrer. It's in my paper, the preprint. And it says, it's a testament in Castilian here. Bartolomé Ferrer. I know it's hard to read it. That's why I under, underline natural, natural, de Ribera Genoa from the Riviera of Genoa from a little village called Albisola in Castilla, that's what it said. I know people call it Spanish. Spanish is the citizen of Spain, right? Uh, we don't speak Great British, we speak English. The dictator Franco invented Spanish as a language. That doesn't exist. There's Galician, there's Castilian, there is Basque, okay? So Castilian is the language, not Spanish. And universities repeat that mistake over and over and over. Okay. So that's it. Uh, Savona is over here, Albisola is over there, Genoa is over here. Ferrer was born here. Now you may ask, oh, but it says natural, so you say it's born in this case. Yeah, in this case there are no other reason, no other context to uh, make you think, well, natural means naturalized. Genoa didn't have any reasons to force naturalization of the citizens, unlike Castile. Okay, so Ferrer declares uh, in 1547 in Peru, in January 27, that he, is, he, he gives the name of his father, of his mother, of his cousin in Nicaragua. And that's it, Nicaragua is the key to understand what I have to show for this. Um, so, you know, in the main focus of your, mm -hmm. you know, we've talked a lot, mm -hmm. the, this presentation is going to be the word natural love. Also. And, you know, the, I'm just playing there with Absolutely, the, you should be skeptical. <laughs> skeptical is good. It would be very easy for this, uh, for the counterparts that have some uh, some other things to say, uh -huh. that why did you pick natural of yeah. being born in other cases not? That's a very far question. Why? In many cases, being natural indeed means you were born in it, but you must put it in context. Is there another possibility? Are people forced to be naturalized or not? In the case of Genoa and Sir Rafael de Paz, a Portuguese medical doctor, natural of Zamora. Zamora is a Spanish city. Maria do Arroyo, of Portuguese nation, natural of Seville, and so on. Out of those 118 Jews in the list, about 30 of them are Portuguese and natural of some Spanish city. 
So many, many examples where this naturalization occurs. So you cannot state that the same natural means necessarily being born. So you have to be very careful with that. Another example. Uh, this is in, in uh, <coughs> uh, New Spain. And there's this fellow, this Portuguese fellow called uh, Francisco Barros Carvalho. I, I didn't realize that the, the letters were so small. I apologize for that. And he's in trouble trying to convince the authorities in New, in New Spain to convince him that he's, he's not a foreigner. And so he says, well, the commission against foreigners will not proceed against me because I'm not Portuguese. Instead, I, I was born in the Kingdom of Galicia. He doesn't convince them, and then he comes back again and he says, I'm natural and born. Natural and born. This is quite natural in a sido. In the Marquesado de Sobros, this is in Galicia, a land in Galicia as well. Okay, so I don't see anything about Cabrillo saying natural and born. Right? This, he couldn't convince them, so we went for a look. Other than being natural, not naturalized, I'm born, right? Natural e nascido. So again, there are many examples like that. So I think whenever we make a claim about this guy is born in Spain, well, hold on, hold on. There's, there are other possibilities here, right? And uh, I strongly suggest for people who are interested in this that you should read, or if you have time, this book from Tamar Erzog. She uh, She's a jurist, she, her background is in law, but then she moved into history, not an astronomer in this case. And she has thousands of examples of naturalization letters where people just bring their goat to the common land and they become neighbors, and from neighbors they become natural of the country. Uh, and in many cases there were no naturalization laws at all, that was the most common. Uh, the Castilian version of her book is how to become a Spaniard. The many ways to become a Spaniard in the 16th and 17th centuries, right? So, this is mandatory reading. I don't know why all the people have been claiming that Cabrillo is Spanish born. They should read this book, number one, right? As an example. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Uh, any, any questions? Please let me know. Oh, yes, sir. So, at that time, uh, did they not break down the names of those who were born in some kind of ledger? Is that, the, is that the challenge you face, we all face? Well, the if, if they did record them, they did not exist. There have been fires, there have been wars, right. that's a problem. To find the worst record, good luck. I wish we could find the worst record, yes, but uh, it's complicated. Uh, there were wars in Mexico. Um, everyone should be aware that we may never find the Cabrillo's worst point, worst record. Uh, this thing happened half a million years ago. Right, so I, I was surprised when I found so many of these things. So let's go now back to João Rodrigues Portugues. Mm -hmm. You know, Cabrillo was mostly known as João Rodrigues in, in, in uh, Juan, sorry, Juan Rodrigues in, um, in Guatemala. But uh, in 1536, there's a mutiny, uh, a coup, to try to take away the governor of um, Honduras called Andrés de Seracida. And uh, there was no uh, salt, no nails, no paper, no bed, but there was gold. <coughs> But you couldn't drink or eat gold, right? So um, the Spanish are completely annoyed with their governor, and they sent some of the citizens asking uh, Pedro de Alvarado, the governor of Guatemala, for help. Senesir and Alvarado were not in good terms from other fights before, and Alvarado needed to play the chess very calmly. So he sent his uh, spearhead guard. Uh, a couple of people uh, induced the other uh, neighbors to live, to disappear, say, okay, we don't respect you anymore, this town is gone. This is Santa Maria de Buena Esperanza del Naco. Naco Valley is just south of San Pedro Sula in Honduras today. And who is spearheading the mutiny? Juan Joan Rodrigues Portugues, man in a horse. At the time, if you were rich, you have a horse, very expensive horses, right? Or mules. Uh, the Spanish conquered the Aztecs with just 16 equines, not 16 horses, some were mules as well. You could uh, make a trade with a boat from a ship from Nicaragua to Peru. Uh, ten horses, you, you would build uh, a ship. So horses were extremely expensive. And so you have Juan Rodrigues Portugues, but you also have Bartolomé Sanchez. Rings the bell, Bartolomé Sanchez. Uh, when uh, Santiago de Guatemala was destroyed when the volcano, the, 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 the rain, one of the persons who died, and Cabrillo wrote, this guy died, this guy died, Bartolomé Sanchez died. It's from Guatemala, right? So I, I have a list of several of the neighbors that did exist in uh, Santa Maria de Buenos Aires de Del Narco. Uh, Juan Ferrol. Ferrol was with um, 
uh, Balboa, when he cited the East Pacific for the first time in 1513 uh, or 14, Ferrol is in Nicaragua, Ferrol is in Honduras. He follows this Juan Rodriguez Portuguese, right? So the same group, the same team, uh, these, these are the fellows, and Carrillo also was in Honduras at the same time. So Juan Rodriguez Portuguese and Carrillo must be the same person as we shall see. If they are not the same person, they are like a twin of each other or a shadow of each other. I, I have like 10, 12 coincidences. They know the same person, they are in the same places, they do business with the same people. Um, it's quite impressive, right? So Juan Rodriguez Portuguese, um, and so this is known by Visco Magoa Portuguese historian since 1940s, 1950s, but he stopped here. This is the tip of the iceberg. If you go back in time, then you find more about this Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. Okay, so as I was saying, in 1536, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo got land in the city of Graças a Deus, which is nowadays in, in Honduras, but he didn't take, uh, take those lands immediately because he went back to uh, Guatemala to actually to, be a, to testify against Pedro Alvarado in a secret trial about other misdeeds of Alvarado. So we have uh, João Rodrigues Cabrillo and we have... Uh, How is that spelled right there? Is that a C? Oh, it's, it's the polygraphic acronym. So this is J-U with an O, so that's the acronym or the, not acronym, sorry, the uh, abbreviation. abbreviation. Yeah, the Cabrillo part. Oh, Cabrillo is C-A-B-R-I-L-L-O in, in Castilian. So the letters with L-L-O? Uh, in Castilian, yes. Okay, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so he got the, 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 the land of Teota and Cotel, right? But what's interesting here is that Cabrillo and João Rodrigues Portuguese are in the same place, in the same war. They must have been, if they are not the same, I mean, uh, once again, uh, uh, devil's lawyer, right? If they're not, in the, they're not the same person, they were together by 10 miles or in the same place. So it's very suspicious that these two fellows are in the same place, right? But let, let's get this further. And then, uh, if you go back, as I was saying, uh, in time, you have the proof of marriage, what the Castilians call the Provence, right? When you die, you show to your king, look, I went to this war, I did this for the, 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 the crown of Spain, I used my horses, I spent my money, I'm entitled to a pension or a farm or something, right? And the children, the son of Cabrillo and the late of the grandson, they say, my father, <coughs> João Rodrigues, right, with an S here, but again, that depends on who does the polygraphic transcription. My father uh, conquered Guatemala, Verapaz, San Salvador, and Nicaragua. Right? This has been totally missed, the Nicaragua part. So now, was he a conqueror of Nicaragua or who was a settler? <clears throat> well, he was on the other side of the military, so he was not in the Nicaraguans for sure. If you, if you look at the troops, the list of troops um, from, oops, oh boy, this is too fast. If you look at the list of troops from uh, Hernandez de Córdoba, right, the, the founder of uh, uh, Nicaragua, even the, the currency of Nicaragua today is de Córdoba, right? The currency of Honduras is de Lempira, after the name, right, so one of the Spanish. Uh, uh, if you look at the list of troops, there is no one for the So obviously he was not in the troops, he was a separate way. But you have Alvar Nunes Portuguese, or Alvar Nunes, as the Castilians call it, right? And if you know the list of boats, the list of ships from the Alvarado, Mendoza fleet, one of the ships is called Alvar Nunes, right? It's Portuguese, and he comes from Panama, right? With uh, Hernandez de Corva to found Nicaragua, and he meets Juan Rodriguez Portuguese there. Let's have a look at that again. So, well, another thing you should be careful with is that um, the proof of merit from the son of Cabrillo is full of mistakes as well. There's severe mistakes, so it's not totally reliable. You have to be careful with that. But in this case, there are other information that um, as you shall see in a few moments, makes it more reliable. But indeed, Cabrillo was in Nicaragua. So the, his son says, my father was in Nicaragua. Uh, now, what else? Wendy Kramer, she did an amazing work, right? She did amazing uh, findings. And she also published this book, the second book of the municipality of uh, Guatemala. And you know the famous Gabriel Cabrera, right? He has a power of attorney. He goes to Spain with the money of Guatemala. The gold is brought. All that story, Cabrillo testifies, and that's where he testifies as Juan Rodriguez, the Palma, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, natural of Palma del Rio. This was the guy, right? Gabriel Cabrera, he was the one who got the money to Spain, he's the one who has to explain everything. When he comes back from Spain, he says, Look, I got all the benefits that we we're planning. The king gave us these uh, um, benefits. Said, one of the benefits that the king gave was this one, extremely important. Kramer missed this. Uh, so His Majesty allows us, the citizens of Guatemala can uh, search for gold in Nicaragua, but mint the gold in Guatemala. 
So this is 1534. He went with Cabrillo in 1530, 31, and he came back with the benefit of now, the gold that we pick up from Nicaragua can be mint or can be uh, treated in, in, in Guatemala. So there were people from Guatemala and Nicaragua before. Who? Cabrillo Sam says was Cabrillo, right? We have a Juan Rodriguez two years there as well. So everything seems to converge that there were people from Guatemala and Nicaragua. Uh, um, yeah. Based on, like, you know, I know you did quite a bit of research on Kramer. Mm -hmm. And did she go any deeper than this uh, testament in court? Uh, <coughs> no. Okay. Wendy Kramer's work is amazing, except in the nationality, nationality part, I think she didn't do a good work. In that particular, everything else is, is solid. So, solid she, so her main uh, topic of the work was done on the court revealings. It was going on. Yeah, exactly. And that's basically what the... Those other documents. But she has other documents that we shall see in a few moments where she, uh, she found business that Cabrillo had with Picon, um, with uh, Pedro Hernandez Picon selling horses in Peru from the Lampard River in San Salvador. And we're going to find Picon in a few moments, which is one of the next two years once again. The same Picon. So let's not look into that. Okay, but the, the important thing is in Nicaragua, once again. Right? There were citizens of Guatemala searching for gold in Nicaragua, but they had to pay one fifth or one tenth of the gold to the crown of Spain, and they have to pay for it in Nicaragua. But this guy, when he came back, Gabriel Cabrera, when he came back from Spain, look, now we can. We can bring the gold that we're uh, mining in Nicaragua, we can bring it to Guatemala. So, another evidence saying that there are people from Guatemala in Nicaragua. Whose people? Who's one of the richest citizens of uh, Guatemala? It was Cabrillo, right? When was gold found in Guatemala for the first time? By the end of 1529, 1530. He lives one year later with a large amount of gold. He couldn't get that much gold in one year. If you look at the, the amount of gold that was made in Guatemala in one year, it's impossible. The mines of Nicaragua were running since 1527, 1528, 1529. Had at least three years to gold mine in Nicaragua, right? So the gold was not from, from Guatemala; it must have come from elsewhere. That's uh, it. Was his uh, brother-in-law, his future brother-in-law, who, who found the first gold mines in Guatemala, right? But Nicaragua was already rich in gold. Now, as I was saying, so, uh, Cabrillo Sanchez, he was in Nicaragua. Alvar Nunes is the owner of a ship in the fleet of uh, Alvarado de Mendoza. Look at that. This is a, a list of the neighbors of Leon de Nicaragua who must pay for a garrison to go and defend the gold mines because the natives were attacking them all the time. In fact, they destroyed it a few times. They were relocated and blah, blah. And we have Alvar Nunes Portuguese, and we have Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. Who is this Juan Rodriguez Portuguese? The Spanish should answer that. Right? The son of Camino says, my father was one of the first settlers. Right? Cabrera says that the people from Guatemala who are in Nicaragua should come to bring the gold here. And Cabrera knew Alvar Nunes, obviously, he built this ship, right? Juan Rodriguez Portuguese also knows Alvar Nunes, right? Furthermore, Juan Ferrol, the same Juan Ferrol, remember, who was in the Honduras with Juan Rodriguez Portuguese, or Cabrera also was? So it's the same people always, the same gang, the same group. You just trace them back and you find them, right? Uh, there are more Portuguese here involved, one called Raposo. Uh, Francisco Fernandes Raposo, who gave the name to the Raposo region, south of Buenaventura in Colombia, in the Pacific coast, where Cabrillo also went in 1541, we shall see in a few moments, okay? Then another one called Bartolome Alves, so there are many Portuguese. This is just one page of many. Now, when did Cabrillo go to Spain? This is 1529, okay? This is probably the oldest document that shows what, in my view, is Portuguese Cabrillo. Juan Rodrigues Portuguese, November 1529, Alvaro Nunes Portuguese, right? Uh, Cabrillo went to Spain. Right, uh, 1531, got his wife. The next document where the mayor of Leon de Nicaragua said, you have to pay for the garrison, the soldiers to go and defend the mines. Juan Rodríguez Portuguese is not there anymore, why? Yes, ma'am. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Why in all these documents have they omitted the name Cabrillo or Cabrillo? Why in the documents of Nicaragua often was Juan Juan Rodríguez? But all the, other, uh, all the other Portuguese seem to have their last names, and only Juan Cabrillo seems not to have the last name. And uh, to me, it just seems odd. And being that one in Rodriguez is such a common name, could it be somebody else? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kramer does that mistake in the. I'm just playing the devil's advocate. I'm just saying. Uh, sorry, sorry, please do. I, I like hard questions, yes. But uh, that has to do with the way. For example, my, my family name is Afonso from my father's side, Juan from my mother's side. If I was Spanish, I would introduce myself Paul Juan. 
But my last name is Afonso, so in Portuguese I say Paulo Afonso. So the Castilians, at least I'm not sure if the Galicians or other Spanish, but I think in old Spain they introduced themselves by the mother's name, not by the father's. So that's complicated. There are many Portuguese who use the, the both family names in some occasions. You shall see some doc the older documents do show, as an example, Antonio Fernandes Portuguese. But if you search more recent documents, they will meet the Portuguese part. So it depends who wrote at what time and in what context. It's not linear at all. So you're saying that Rodriguez was his mother's name? Mm -hmm. uh, most probably. And I, I have some documents in a few moments that give some support for that. Okay. In 1520s in La Pelle of Cabril, there was a family, there was a mother called Domingos Rodriguez. She had a son, Duarte Rodriguez, who was becoming a priest. And they lived nearby where it could be in the 1520s. So, I mean, you might say, okay, so Rodriguez, but that was a very small village. Uh, how, in 200 people, I mean, if it is Lisbon or San Diego, I'm sure there's a John Smith here, there are 200 of them, right? Or Simpsons, or, but in a small place that you find the Rodriguez in that particular time, that has some meaning, right? Yes, please. Well, I was just going to talk to that, too. I had the same question, this is my husband, but I had the same question to him the first time he was telling me all of this very excitedly, and I was like, what? What is that? I don't understand. But I didn't understand exactly that. Who's was Juan Rodriguez. But then yeah. he explained mother's name, father's name, versus father's name, mother's name, and Juan, Joao. So it's... It could, be, it could be that Cabrillo was a bastard as well. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in the sense of uh, not having, not in a bad sense, yeah. but not having a father. So being an illegal son from a, not a wedding, and therefore he would have the, the, the name of his mother. We call that the bastard son, but not the bastard person. So there's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no documents that show a Juan, uh, Juan Rodriguez and then a Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo in the same document, correct? Um, let me see, in the same document, uh, maybe this, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. There might be, there might be where, um, I think so, actually there are, there are. Uh, but, uh, there's one as an example, there's a testament of Pedro Panelius, who was a tailor, a uh, rich tailor, who was a very good friend in Panama of Juan Rodriguez Portuguese, but another one, another homonym, in, Pan in Panama. And sometimes he shows up as Juan Rodriguez, and sometimes he shows up as Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. And his wife, the Lord. So, so in the same testament, the same person appears as just Juan Rodriguez and Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. But this one is not familiar. But it's just one one person. I'm not talking about one person. I'm saying in the context yeah. of being more than one person with the same with similar names. Right. It can happen that uh, I have four names: Paul Manuel, <coughs> common names, João and Fons. You can call me Paul Fons. I can call Paul Manuel João Fons or Paul João Fons. Especially in the U.S. Social Security, I can only put three names. I have four. So my name sometimes when I do the taxes, if I don't do Paul Manuel Alfonso, Paul Joao Alfonso, it's always me, but depends on many. So it, it's possible. In the particular case of Cabrillo, I think there might be a couple of documents where his name appears. Uh, sometimes Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, sometimes, well, in Honduras, you see, he shows up as Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo, but he also shows up as Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. Who calls him Juan Rodriguez Portuguese? The ones who knew he was called Juan Rodriguez was in Nicaragua. Because in Nicaragua, there was another Juan Rodriguez. Juan Rodriguez Chamorro. But it rarely appears as Juan Rodriguez. Whenever there's a Juan Rodriguez, the other one is Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. Okay, so that's a distinction. So they didn't call him Juan Rodriguez Chamorro, the other fellow, but that, that's his name. And he came with the troops of uh, Hernandez de Cordova as well. You will find it in the list of troops, right? So, but rarely he would be called Juan Rodriguez Chamorro. It's always Juan Rodriguez, Juan Rodriguez. And therefore, the other one must be distinguished. So it became Juan Rodriguez. But the, the people from Nicaragua always call him Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. In Nicaragua, in Guatemala, he was only known as Juan Rodriguez. At some point, he needed to put Cabrillo. And that's in Honduras. People say that in 1526 is the first time that he shows up as Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. They thought until now. Uh, in 1526, but Kramer bought other documents showing that he was known as Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo even before. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, first of all, thank you very much for being here. I'm very impressed by your curriculum. But, um, I have a concrete question. Where was Cabrillo born? Let me answer that in a few moments, if you are patient enough. I don't know the answer. I, one has to be honest, always. But there is good evidence supporting that he may have been born in the north of Port, in La Pelle, La Pelle of Cabrillo. Uh, we're not totally sure, but there's some data that uh, makes it harder to say, hmm, this is not possible. It's possible. Uh, it's the best information we have. He was well, born in La Pelle of Cabrillo. Uh, I have visited Montalegre. Mm -hmm. And there is a statue of Cabrillo in yeah. Montalegre. Yeah. Uh, the statue was erected in 1989, 
As you know, all these Portuguese navigators that uh, circulate the globe, uh -huh. and by the way, I don't want to say that the reading is not Portuguese, but mm -hmm. all my doubts. Oh, uh, that's fair enough. My doubts are that, and my feelings, and mm -hmm. for what I have read and investigated, and I'm not a historian, I'm mm -hmm. just trying to find out who is really true. That's, that's why I'm always about to find the and fact. This should be really written with concrete parts. Absolutely. Not invasions. Not, not at all. And, and the Portuguese community here in the uh, Roda, in the, I'm San Diego, Roda, where I was living, in uh, San Diego, are very much uh, swearing that Karim was Portuguese. I, I believe with these documents they are right. But it shouldn't be because I believe. It should be because the documents say so. But uh, anyway, and I hope the documents say so. Can I answer that question? Yeah. And uh, the Portuguese community a response that is Portuguese based on the Spanish history. The only true fact that we have was written by Antonio Herrera 50 years later after Cabrillo's existence. And that document, written by someone that worked for the King of Spain, knowing that Portugal is a completely rival of Portugal, knowing that Spain is equal to what U.S. is to Russia right now, or U.S. Ukraine, if you want to put it to extremes. How could a king allow a prominent to, uh, to write something like that if there wasn't truth behind it? So that's, and I'm going to, let's leave it at that because what Paulo is presenting here is facts, it's documents. And I think we're not going to go into debates about that because I, you know, he's got a very good presentation. One question that I have uh, for for Paul is, um, I'll, even today's day, there's uh, the common sense that people say, "Oh, he's John from P, mm -hmm. João de P, or João de Madeira." Is there any documents, or did you find anything that ties wrong? Rodrigues to be from Gabriel. Yeah. That that shows that I, I, maybe that's the where the name Gabriel comes from. We can, yeah, we will go that at home. But I just want to finish this set of questions. I believe that science should be the test of emotion. You should have documents saying so. Mm -hmm. If it turns out to be Spanish or Castilian, fine. But I think the documents at this moment with the several documents I'm adding, it leads a lot to the Portuguese side. Plus, there's not one single document, zero document saying Cabrillo was born in Spain. It says yeah. natural from. Excuse me. Natural. It's not being born. I just show some examples. It, it, the Spaniards' archive says that he was born in Palma del Rio. They don't. No, they don't. Sir, they say he was natural from. Let me give you that example. What document do you have? Uh, That's what document do you have that says that? I don't have a document. He's nobody, nobody, nobody what else. History, what history? What, what reference do you have to say that? Other than is natural de. No, it says that was born. No, no, sir, uh, you're wrong. The interpretation of the person who saw the real history is made with primary sources. People look at primary documents and they make interpretations. The interpretation says he was born in Spain. The document doesn't say that. The document says he's natural from or native. The natural is. It's not. Born. Look, look, no, 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 yeah. look American exclusive. <laughs> From now on, I call it natural, as if you were born, do as if you were born. Do you translate natural as a native? It's a synonym. In English, natural and native are the same thing. Well, a native is a person that was born in that. Or natural. Right, right. Or. It can be, it can be, it can be, that's right, it can be born, but not necessarily. Yeah. And you see, look, this is, this is a vital letter of a man who's pussy. You want to read it for me, sir? I don't know if you read it, and I apologize for the small, but it says, from now on, you're going to be considered native or natural of my kingdoms, as if you were born. There you go. It doesn't say it was born, you are native, as if you were born. And there are many, many examples like this. So how can you say, if it says you are natural, it doesn't mean necessarily you were born. And specifically, in the context, so no document says to be was born. The interpretation of the people who saw the documents, simplistically, prematurely, say so. But the documents themselves, no. So Without any emotion, just the facts, they don't say it was born. Portuguese historian says that he was born in uh, Montalegre. No Portuguese historian says that either. Well, 
you have to search it in the uh, municipality of Montalegre. Well, I, I, okay. <laughs> Let me confidence up. I know the president of the municipality who built the statue. I know the Portuguese Prime Minister, Cavaco Silva, he went there inaugurating the statue. And I asked him, how can you build the statue? How can you inaugurate the Prime Minister? What's, that? What's your document? Oh, the family says, there are many histories like that. Some family 200 years ago, they counted, there's some, the people are honest, they have good faith, but they, they understood something wrong 200 years ago. It was a story like this, it became a story like that. It's possible. You're not lying, but you're telling the story to be misunderstood. But Mr. Alfonso. Uh, Let me finish, please, if, if you want. And I asked the mayor, how the heck you build the statue just based on blah, blah. You should have done the, the, the carbon-14 measurement. You cannot just build the statue. And then the prime minister, of course, would, I wouldn't do it. I told him, you who had the balls, excuse me, to build the statue like based on that. So there is no Portuguese story, period, that says that. It was just a mayor that took the political decision of building a statue based on a, on a family tradition, nothing else. Nothing else. And I wish there was more. I wish there was more to support so this were, brave decision. So that decision was wrong. Well, that decision was bold. I, I wouldn't do it myself. But you have to understand that the conditions of the Portuguese city. He's just trying to promote his, his seat, and he believed the family. And now I have new died. I paid for the, these results myself, from my pocket to get the carbon-14 results. Nobody did it. It's been decades. It should have been done. And now the, the data supports and the cruci supports the family. So if you just wait a little bit more, we'll go to that. And now we have, but there are no Portuguese historians saying Gabriel was born there. There is no Portuguese document at all. What we have is a family tradition, and now we have carbon-14 data, which is very difficult to, to, to go around. If you, if you just wait five minutes more, I will show the data in a moment. Right? But just, just when I'm correct, there's no Portuguese story. Just yeah. very quickly. But, sir. As you know, the Portuguese statue is all over Portugal. Uh -huh. For example, the uh -huh. began as a statue in scenes where it was born. Yeah, yeah. And uh, what happened is that all these statues were erected in the 18th century, 19th century, mm -hmm. even before. Mm -hmm. Why Cabrillo had that? Statue mm -hmm. being erected in the 20th century. 1989. I think there I mean, was a discovery that he was born. You, you have to ask him. As I said, there is not much support, and there was not much support that Cabrillo was born. It was just a, a family tradition. Simple people say, look, this guy gave this crucifix to my family hundreds of years ago. And they're honest. They seem, I don't see why they should be lying. However, it's possible that you know, 200 years ago, they misunderstood the story and ended up being not well counted later, right? So there was no mayor before who decided to believe to the point of building a statue. I think that's the answer. You have to ask the other mayors in decades, why didn't you build the statue 100 years ago, 100 years ago? Why did this particular mayor decide to do it? It was, it was a jump of faith, a jump into the emptiness. It turns out he might be right. But, but he could be the opposite. Uh, in Sabrosa, north of Porto, there's a statue of Magellan saying he was born here, he was not. New documents say it was born, so that sector should be tilted down. So that example where things went wrong. But in this particular case, the date of the carbon-14, I think things went well. And you can, you can see the date of carbon-14 in a few moments, and then you tell me if the family is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. He, he does, yeah. I have a quick question. Yes, please. Uh, in your research, mm -hmm. is um, João or Juan Rodriguez reference more than with a Cabrillo reference. Um, so it's, it's so like you say, uh, Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. Well, as an example, nobody knew that João Rodriguez Cabrillo was known as Juan Rodriguez de Palma. Okay. But when he was under the Spanish law authorities, he said, well, I'm from Palma. Right. So he would play, he would dance differently to right. different music. Right. He was known as Juan Rodriguez in Guatemala. In Nicaragua, there was another Juan Rodriguez, who needed to be Juan Rodriguez Portuguese. Right. In, uh, in Spain, it was Juan Rodriguez Palma, because with the book, I'm naturalized, I'm from here, don't give me the lot. So depends on you, where he was, he would show a different ID, so to speak. Right? Which, which, makes sense, sorry, which makes sense, because like, in, in Latin America, mm -hmm. you have your natural name, your father's name goes first, and then your mother. So I, I, what do you mean by that? In Brazil, that's not the case. There's, there's lots of Americans. In Brazil, but in, in Portuguese in, America, in, in uh, Guatemala, in Mexico, Spanish, the Spanish speaking, right. yeah. that's what sort of, So it yeah. would be natural exactly. that he would say Juan Rodriguez Portuguese, exactly. because the Cabrillo is is just exactly. you know a third name. It's a possibility. Yeah. Uh, someone was raising their hand. No, I was just going to ask you. No disrespect, they may let you go on with your presentation. Oh, I, yes, sure. I, I, I don't I'm mind sure the director. Okay, okay. Uh, well, this is an informal talk. 
that's how we made it. No, <laughs> mostly. And I, I like tough questions. It must be tough. We must be skeptical. We must ask the hard questions. In order for things to survive, we must confront all the hard questions. Now, I'm quite confident about how solid these documents are, so please feel free. Okay, so it's very important to see that no document says Kibrit was born in Spain. The interpretation of the people who read the documents is a different story. Okay, and I brought this example in particular because as if you were born, be careful with that. And there are many, many, many other examples like this. And I also gave you another example of being natural and, and born. Because natural was not sufficient, right? This guy, Francisco Barros Cabrini, said, look, not only I'm natural or naked, but I'm born as well. First time he didn't go, so now he went double, double wham. I'm natural and born, naked and born. Why did he feel the need to say that? Because people, the interpretation they make of natural is, well, are you natural born or natural naturalized? Well, I'm natural and born. Right? So that's a paradigmatic example in my view as well. Right? Okay, so going on, as I was saying, so we were in Nicaragua, right? Very important. Uh, we get uh, we get all the nuns Portuguese and we get one of the rich Portuguese and let's continue with that. Some of you are not boring, boring, boring. <laughs> uh, oops. Okay. And now I, um, I was saying, why didn't Cabrini pay for the garrison of the gold mines in Buenos Aires along the Segovia and Cocor River? in the border of Honduras, gold on Honduras, gold on Nicaragua. He should have played the following year, 1532, but he didn't. He gave up of the gold? No, he was in Spain. We were getting up his wife. That's why Juan Rodriguez Portuguese disappears at the same time that Cabrini disappears. But uh, Alvar Nunes is still paying, João Ferrol is still paying, Francisco Fernandes Raposo is still paying, because they were still there in Nicaragua, but Cabrini was not. Cabrini was in Spain. And Juan Rodriguez Portuguese also disappears. What a coincidence, isn't it? When does Cabrillo comes back to Nicaragua again with his wife via Panama? March 1533. When does Juan Rodriguez Portugues shows up in Nicaragua again? March 1533. With a, with a 16 liters of wine, Juan Rodriguez Portugues comes back with a, a robe of vin, 16 liters of wine, to give to the church in the mines of Buenos Aires uh, in Leon and Granada, right? He was a neighbor of uh, Leon, and we know Cabrini was back there because Alvarado also has a letter written at the same time. And this is a little bit of the work of Wendy Kramer. Alvarado is here in the Gulf of Fonseca, after the Bishop Fonseca from the Spanish, and he writes a letter to Guatemala. Yeah, we know that Juan Rodriguez arrived. The letter just says Juan Rodriguez, but in the context we know it's Cabrini. But Juan Rodriguez arrived, and he got the good news that Gabriel Cabrera, all the benefits, now we only pay one tenth of the gold of the crown, we will pay one fifth, yay, let's get more money, right? Uh, and he said, yeah, he gave me the, the original document, he arrived. And he's here, uh, Juan Rodriguez Portuguese, and this is a couple of kilometers. So, Juan Rodriguez Portuguese and Cabrillo are like a shadow of each other. I forgot a few moments ago to show Juan de la Calle. Juan de la Calle, who was who? Anyone knows who was Juan de la Calle? Cabrillo had three uh, native. Uh, daughters from the native, probably a Maya, from the Yucatan Maya, and Juan de la Calle was a son-in-law, the son-in-law of Cabrillo, he married one of his daughters. Where does he find Juan de la Calle? In Nicaragua. Juan Rodriguez Portuguese knew Juan de la Calle, Cabrillo knew Juan de la Calle. So once again, worst case scenario, they were twins, or worst case scenario, they were in the same place, doing business with the same people, disappearing and appearing at the same place, being in the same battles. So, to me, it's impossible to have so many coincidences without being the same person, but... Uh, Paulo. Yes, sir. Would he possibly, this is just an idea, mm -hmm. would he maybe use a different name for security? Uh, because transporting so much gold and pirates... And His gold didn't disappear. Who disappeared was the gold from the city, the, the fifth that was given to the crown. Now, uh, the skepticals, Properly, we will ask questions. But look, there was another Juan Rodriguez Portuguese in Panama. How do you know if it's not the same person? In 1541, this is a very difficult document to read because the ink and the back got blurred. But if you do, I, I wrote here the transcription. You can see here Juan, not easy, right? But is it a Juan? A J U with those. This is an abbreviation for Juan. The R S for Rodriguez Portuguese. The spelling is exactly like that. That's P U R T U. Okay, Juan Rodriguez Portuguese with whom? Pedro Rodriguez Picon. Rings any bell, Picon? 
the Picon, Cristobal Picon from Guatemala, one of the best friends of Cabrillo. The, the other guy was called Pedro Hernandez Picon with Cabrillo, with Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. They have a company selling horses in Peru. Kramer published that, that result as well. So Cabrillo knew Pedro Hernandez Picon. And he knew Cristobal Rodriguez Picon. Juan Rodriguez Picon, Portuguese goes with Pedro Rodriguez Picon. When? In July 1541. By then, the guy from Panama was dead. I found a testament of Pedro uh, Paredes. The, the, the fellow from Panama was in Spain already in 1539. So this Juan Rodriguez Portuguese cannot be the one from Panama. Right? This is a very critical document. Because Alvarado died in 1541 as well. And nobody knew exactly how soon Cabrillo left Navidad. Where did he go? Uh, so th this is an extremely important document, OK? This Pedro Rodriguez Picon and Juan Rodriguez Portuguese once again. Right? OK. Um, So uh, he went where in 1541? He went to Buenaventura, the Bay of Buenaventura, just slightly north of Raposo, the Raposo River, as I mentioned, Raposo, uh, Francisco Fernandes Raposo, who was also in the gold mines of Nicaragua. Once again, the same gang, the same crew, right? Sebastián de Manalcazar, the governor of Popayán and Cali, he was together with all the rooms. They were in jail together because the mayor uh, of uh, Leon de Nicaragua, when Pedro Davila died, the governor died, he gave part of his fortune to uh, uh, Alvar Nunes, and uh, the mayor wanted part of that fortune, so he arrested Alvar Nunes, he arrested Sebastián de Benalcazar. Benalcazar later finds El Dorado, the, the mythical El Dorado from the Muisca, together with Jiménez de Quezada, up here, they went back to Spain uh, to divide all those areas, but they need the horses, right? To, to go up in Buenaventura to Cali, and so most probably that's what Cabril or Juan Rodríguez Portuguese and the Picon, the Picons once again, when selling horses to this area. Okay, so just to give you an idea, in six days you could go from Panama to Colombia, or eight, nine days could be in the Caracas of the, the Papagayo Winch. There's some months of the year when it's not good to travel there. Okay, furthermore, not done yet. So you were talking about horses, I have a silly question. Could Cabrillo and Caballero be uh -huh. mixed? <laughs> the idea that a Caballero, instead they decided to shorten it or to make it a nickname to say it's Cabrillo instead of Caballero? Caballero has to be like a Chevalier or a Caballero. Well, 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 the definition I looked up, it says knight. I, I have many cousins by Caballero. Like, he wrote, like you said, he was one of the richest people to be able to ride a horse. Right, right. So would they possibly give him a nickname that it's Juan Rodriguez who's a horseman? No, I, I, I don't because right? I mean, Cabrillo. Cabrillo, the, the place, you know, that we're saying. So. I think you might have to do more with the place, not so much with the Cavaliero, right? Right. Uh, I have many guys who are called Cavaliero. One of my first, Abelita Cavaliero, many, many people are called Cavaliero in my family. Right. But uh, I don't know if they were nice long time ago. I have to search that in my village, but, or if they killed that Portuguese king at some point. <laughs> but no, I, I think it, it, if anything, nobody knows exactly, if anything, you may have to do with the place of the lo no location anymore. By the way, some people insist, oh, there are many places in Portugal that claim Cabrillo was born. That, that's not true anymore, right? There's only one place that still claims that Cabrillo was born. And if you check all the others, they've been discarded. But the information in the US is not updated at that point of view. Okay, so as I was saying, the, the all Albany, one of the rich Portuguese of Panama, he comes back to Spain in 1539. I found the testament of his friend Pedro Paredes. Um, he says the night, there you go, Juan Rodriguez and his wife, Leonardo de Souza, but then it shows Juan Rodriguez Portuguese in the same, in the same document, deceased, right? And so it's impossible that this Juan Rodriguez Portuguese is the same one I went in 1541 to um, uh, Colombia or whatever, right? Okay? Uh, I found this in the Palencia's Cathedral Archives. This is the part three of my work where we discussed the homonyms, right? Okay, so furthermore, so, uh, where do we have the other? How do we know that Alvar Nunes was Portuguese? So in 1546, uh, when the Viceroy of uh, New Spain uh, was about to move to Peru, the Spanish had this system where they would do an internal trial to evaluate his performance. And there was a judge called Francisco Tel Sandoval who came to evaluate his performance. Uh, and there was a summary of the complaints done against the Vice King. And there you go, Alvar Nunes, Portuguese pilot. Alvar Nunes, Portuguese pilot, right? The same Alvar Nunes who was the drone of the Portuguese, the same Alvar Nunes who was the ship Santa Maria de Buenos Aires, the same Alvar Nunes who was the ship in May of 1542 complaining, if my ship goes to discover California, I have to get half of the money back that appeared in Alvarado promised me, right? But the ship who went to California, Santa Maria de Alvarado, is not Santa Maria de Buenos Aires. 
Was it rebaptized? That's what every council says. But we don't have the documents say it was rebaptized. But everything seems to point that the ship indeed was rebaptized. <coughs> so this is a summary of about four months. <coughs> excuse me, four months of trial, where in the beginning um, Alvar Nunes was yeah you are right uh, you should get the money back. But Alvar was dead by then in a war with the natives, in a mixed up war, uh, and his nephew Juan Alvarado was the one who was supposed to buy Alvar Nunes Portuguese for the other half of the ship. Half of the ship was from Alvar Nunes Portuguese, the other half was from Alvarado. Okay. So in first instance he won the trial, in second instance he lost, he went to third instance. So uh, there must be a large file with all this documentation somewhere in the archives of Mexico. I've been trying to find it for more than one year. Uh, it's a pain in the neck to deal with the Mexico um, archives, so I may end up to go there myself, I don't know. But uh, that's the only hope I have to find more information about this particular ship. What's important is this, if uh, San Salvador was from Cabrillo, most probably Portuguese. Now, Alvar Nunes is also Portuguese, period. He's a pilot, period, right? And he has a ship with most probably was also the second largest one. So we may have the two largest ships in the Discovery of California were Portuguese, right? Thank you, sir. thank you so much. Okay. And again, there are more documents like this, but uh, Alvar Nunes is Portuguese without any doubt. His ship is there. Uh, I, I'm working on the details of this in the second part of, of my paper as well, right? Okay, so here we go. Alvin Nunes, she has the ship, the register of a ship called Santa Maria of Buenos Aires, or Our Lady of uh, Good Hope, that belongs to Alvin Nunes, right? He goes to Panama in 1539, so the ship was built in Estapa, in the harbor of Guatemala, where Cabrillo was doing all the stuff, as Alvin Nunes himself also confirms in another document. So Alvin Nunes knew Cabrillo, period. Alvin Nunes knew Juan Rodriguez Portuguese, period. Once again, the same guy as I. To me, it's totally impossible. One of these things must be, cannot be anyone else other than Kim right? All the documents point in that direction, right? And the collection, Samosa, uh, this is where I found most of my book. This is a, a huge compilation of 17 volumes, 17 volumes, done by the ambassador of Nicaragua, and Samosa was the, the dictator of, of Nicaragua. He was the ambassador, but in his free time, he would go to the archives of Spain and collect every single paper about Nicaragua. <coughs> and he wrote in the beginning, you know, in the future, someone will find diamonds who are hiding here. And I don't know who is, but there were diamonds hidden, right? And the, indeed, right? This Corazón Somoza is quite amazing. Okay, so Alvin Munch indeed was um, Portuguese, and he had a ship, and most probably, but he didn't go to California. He stayed in Mexico, complained, hey, I want the money for my ship. My ship is not here anymore, give me the money. But so he didn't come to California, okay, but the ship was his, right? Okay, so you see an idea. This is the region of the Santa Maria Buenos Aires mines in Segovia. This is the Coco River or Segovia. This is Honduras full of gold on this side. And uh, Leon Nicaragua, where Cabrillo was, for sure. We have declarations from Cabrillo himself in, in Leon. And Juan Rodriguez, and his son saying, my father was in Nicaragua. And people from Guatemala were gold in mine in Nicaragua as well. And so many things says, says that, right? Uh, and so, um, Santa Maria de Buenos Aires is the key. That's the name of the ship of Alvar Nunes. That's the name of the gold mines as well, right? Not only that, but Santa Maria de Buenos Aires, in this case of NACU, in NACU, NACU Valley, uh, when Andres Celestino, the, the governor of uh, Honduras, he, he found some gold mines here, but Andres Celestino was before the treasure of Nicaragua. Honduras tried to occupy Nicaragua in another war between the Spanish, who is the governor of what? So most of the crew from Honduras was the crew, let's say the governor, the mayor, etc. So they knew each other better than the Hondurians and the Caraguas. And they built, um, again, gold mines here in Naco, which is not very far away from the Buena Esperanza of Nicaragua. When Alvarado goes with about 300,000 troops, mostly natives, some of them cannibals, right? To save uh, the, the governation of um, uh, uh, Honduras, he stays here in Tencoa. This is about 30 miles from the place, he could have gone immediately. Why did he stop there? Why did he send Juan Rodriguez Portuguese ahead first? Because he knew the little from Nicaragua. He arrived exactly when the population is leaving, when they're rebelling against the government. He came as a savior. Perfect chess playing, right? So that's Tencoa, the headquarters of uh, uh, Alvarado coming from Guatemala. That's the Buenos Aires gold mines from Nicaragua, the Buenos Aires gold mines from uh, uh, Honduras, the Buenos Aires ship from uh, uh, other moons. Okay. Uh, nobody sleep yet, I'm surprised. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a list of the 13 ships that uh, 
so it's half in Portuguese, this is from my draft from my own notes in brute shape. Uh, but uh, you have the six ships that went with the uh, Villalobos, like the the Villalobos, to baptize the Philippines, invade Portuguese territory, violate the agreements with Portugal, as typically the Spanish did at the time and even today. Uh, <laughs> today, there is a part of the Portuguese border, yeah, European Union, the Europe. Spain occupies all the for 200 years, despite saying Portugal is right. We promise to give you back the, the territory as soon as possible. This is since 1817. Looks like the Himalayas between China and India. I'm sorry, I have, I have good friends in Spain, but the Spanish government is a pain in the neck. They should honor what they say. Um, and so, here you go, all the, the ships that went between the walls, right? You, you can eliminate six or seven of them. So, which ships are left? Okay, you have San Salvador from, from uh, Cabrillo. We have Aldo Nunes, probably the La Victoria. We have Anton Fernandes. Whose ship was this? Nobody knows. There's nothing about Anton Fernandes. Also a Karak or Urca kind of ship. The San Francisco, we don't know what happened to it as well. But all the others either went to Villa Lobos or the Dios not in the Figueroa. This one was reimbursed later with uh, whatever was left from the Alvarado fortune. Uh, so let's have a look into a little bit more of that. Um, who was Anton Fernandes, right? So, <laughs> anyone knows this volcano in uh, Nicaragua, the Masai volcano? Sorry, maybe my feet are hurting. Uh, so there's a crazy Spanish monk who convinced uh, Antonio Fernandes Portuguese, Nicaragua French, and a couple other Spanish to go inside the volcano to search for gold. <laughs> <laughs> this is still like that. This volcano is amazing. It's bursting open. And so they went there many times until the, the mayor of Leon said, Enough, you're going to kill yourselves and whatnot. This is the only Anton Fernandes from that period that shows up in all the documentation. And he's from Granada, of Nicaragua. And uh, you see the same one, the same Anton Fernandes Portuguese. Granada has the best wood, the best pitch, the best cuisine to make ships, right? Uh, well, we don't know, but we know something else. We know. We know there are other Portuguese with the same name with boats and ships. Juan Fernandes, Fernandes Portuguese, he bought a brigantine a ship, uh, also from Granada. Was he brother of Antonio Hernandez? Maybe not, but the name is the same. Diogo Hernandez, also Portuguese, also with a ship coming from Nicaragua. I don't know if they are from the same family, but they all are Portuguese, they have the same family name, they all have boats, right? So, um, that's an hypothesis. This is not categoric, like in the case of uh, Alvar Lund, but maybe this is Anton Fernandes, or Antonio Fernandes Portuguese. Who is Antonio Fernandes from? Uh, uh, Granada had lots of farmers, very rich farmers, and lots of boats or ships, and would do commerce with Peru. There are many examples of that. So I wouldn't be surprised if Antonio Fernandes ends up being Antonio Fernandes Portuguese. That's the best model, the best hypothesis we have. If anyone else has better ideas about Antonio Fernandes, they're welcome. I think this is the first time ever that someone suggests as well. This may be Antonio Fernandes. Heavy counsel himself doesn't know, nobody knows, but I think this is a possibility. So our knowledge is highly complete, right? Uh, and so the other day, my daughter, my eight years old daughter, she's sleeping by now, <laughs> and my, my mother, they start making a painting. So hey, how did Camino look like? They were looking for an island of California. <coughs> What was the face of Alvar Nunes? Nobody knows. Alvar Nunes is a Portuguese. They had two ships fighting in California. They met in Leon, in Nicaragua, near the Momotomba. The Momotomba was the volcano that destroyed later Leon, Leon Vieja, the old Leon. They built Leon new later. So like the painting of my daughter and my, my, my mother, it's incomplete. Uh, the knowledge we have about Cabrillo and the Alvar Nunes and on top of the movie. But we start seeing some, some other, other features, right? Uh, and so some of the things we need to look at to answer the gentleman there a few moments ago. Uh, oops, there we go. So which documents may hint for Cabrillo being born in Portugal? So these are documents from the uh, uh, district archives of Braga, the University of Minho in Braga, which is north of Porto. And these are the church records that show that this lady called Domingos Rodrigues had a son called Duarte Rodrigues. You can see it here, Duarte Ruiz, R-O-I-Z, which is a Portuguese polygraphic abbreviation for Rodrigues, right? Uh, he's becoming a priest, he needs to go to some degrees, and, and he can only do it when he's at least 20 years old. So this document is from 1540s, 20 years less, at 1520s. So it was a Rodrigues family from 1520s in that area, which is a very small population, that's meaningful. And then you also have Domingos Rodrigues up here, he's a widow, she's, she's leaving some of her lands to the church, 
and whatnot. So these two documents exist. So the guy who said, we didn't find anything in Portugal, look properly. Right? Look properly. Uh, furthermore, uh, <coughs> we have uh, uh, Mr. Manuel José Gonçalves. Uh, well, his name is Gonçalves now, but his, his family before, his parents were all Rodrigues. So everyone calls him Rodrigues. Hey, Rodrigues, how are you in the street? I know him personally. It's a nice fellow. He was a mariner himself. But, uh, commerce, and so that's a crucifix. They've been claiming this was given by Cabrillo to the family a long time ago, from generation to generation to generation. Based on which, finally, one day, one may have decided to build a statue. <laughs> Not because any Portuguese story says nothing. There's no document saying that may have decided to go. That's it. You have to ask him why did they decide why the others didn't build any statue. And so, uh, I mean, they are honest people. I don't have any reason to suspect they are lying and they're not making money out of it. Why, why would they be lying? However, they could have a wrong history. Well, someone, maybe I misunderstood what my great great grandfather told me. That's possible. There's, there's an example of um, a fellow in uh, Lepe, in near Sevilla. This is the church where Jean de Solis was baptized. And my grandfather told me so. He was wrong. It was Jean de Solis was Portuguese. So he misunderstood from his grandfather for sure. He was not lying. He was just telling the story that he heard, but the story was not well told. Right? Well, so it's possible that they learned the wrong story. But it's possible they're saying the truth as well. Anyway, oral tradition doesn't make it as a document in, in history, right? So I ask, hey, why don't you date? This is wood. You could date carbon-14, pray to carbon. Hello? You should have done this decades ago, right? He promised he would never, the crucifix would never leave his house. He didn't want to bring it to the lab in the university. But after one year of conversations, he agreed to cut a tiny bit. We remove one of the edges and we cut a little bit of the wood. And we sent it to the Queen's University of Belfast, a carbon-14 lab there. And I couldn't believe what I saw. So, uh, if you think about it, uh, Cabrillo came to Spain when? To get his wife. In 15? In 1531, 1532, he comes back as Juan Rodriguez Portuguese in 1533, right? Everybody's asleep by now. Why not everybody's asleep right now? Right? I cannot ask the hard questions, right? So if you went to Portugal, you know from Wendy Kramer, without Wendy Kramer work, I couldn't conclude this. So you must have gone to Portugal to believe this family, okay? If he gave you the crucifix, as you said, then he gave it to you in 1530s. 1531, 1532, that's when he came here. We know he was here. There you go, the peak. Uh, so uh, to explain it, um, we have this age called the carbon-14 age in before the present years. The present is uh, 1950, that's when we discovered that carbon-14 works in such a way. You have to calibrate the results of the carbon-14 to real data, right? And this is, uh, in green, you have the one sigma, the physical uh, statistical fluctuations. In, in yellow, you have the two sigma. It could fluctuate a little bit more. In green, this wiggle, uh, large curve here, this, this is dendrochronology, as you measure, calibrating rings of trees. Trees have different ages, they grow a ring every year or so. And if you look at, uh, in California, amazing trees from 5,000 years ago, right? The Bristol pine cones, right? Christian or something similar. Some of the oldest trees in the world. So you can go back even 5,000 years to calibrate again something. Okay, so you calibrate your data, and you can see when the peak matches the data. So you can see there's a peak <coughs> here, right? Almost in one sigma. And if you trace a line, boom. That's 1528, 1529, 1530s. Wow. Exactly when Cabrillo. That's impressive. When I saw it, it's like, I cannot believe this. It's like, imagine the crazy guy saying, look, I have a, cru a crucifix here. This is from uh, Captain Cook or from Christopher Columbus in my family. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But then you have the carbon-14, so wow, well, that's possible. However, we also have a peak <coughs> from 1650. As you can see, the center of the measurement, they point also to this possible uh, calibration. But nothing supports this peak here where the family is saying, hey, this is the crucifix that Cabrillo gave me around 1530s when he was in Spain, when the carbon 14 says it can be possible. Wow. Plus, you also have the document from the Rodriguez family. And no, no historian says nothing about this. this. This is me. I pay for this result. I pay for my pocket for the analysis of this stuff. And this is science, physics, not astronomy, but physics, hardcore as a kind. This is a document. Someone has to explain me why 1530 is a possibility, right? So, yeah, you can ask, well, but you can also be 1650, you can. In abstract, you can. But uh, it can also be 1530. And the family says so, they have a crucifix. So to me, together with that sort of doc, that makes a stronger case for Cabrillo to be indeed born in um, Lapel, Lapel Cabrillo. 
Okay, uh, I'm almost done. Does the size of the sample affect the result? Oh boy, no, in this case it doesn't. The reason that the gentleman didn't want to... So there's a Portuguese nuclear reactor near Lisbon, but they have a method that needs to consume about 20 grams, and there would be a chunk of the, of the crucifix. Obviously, they don't want to damage the crucifix, but it's a value. But uh, there's another one, we only require 0.1 grams. So just a tiny knife, we cut tiny, tiny bits, I wrap them very carefully, send them to the UK. So it, it doesn't, you, you need to, actually I send too much. It, it doesn't, uh, I, I wish it would, that we could cut more, unfortunately. Uh, yes, because um, the solutions are, uh, what we call it, the general, they're more than one solution, right? Uh, I contacted uh, experts in sacred art. So look at this photo, what do you think? 17th century, 18th century, minimum. So, but when I showed them the results, well, I, it doesn't look, they don't believe the results in terms of their artistic impression of what the crucifix looks like to them. They know similar crucifix in what's Italy today from the 17th, 18th century. But that's a subjective opinion, right? Anyway, this is novelty, and uh, there is no reason for this peak. But, and if you quantify the probability, actually, although this peak is higher, but it's narrower, the probability here is almost as good as the probability there, right? If you look in the type, I'm sorry, the numbers are too small. I thought this was a bigger projector. The, the letters will be bigger. Okay, so that's a carbon 14. And I, I don't want to massacrate you too much more, so I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, and so, um, um, I would say our knowledge is quite incomplete, but what else do we know? Try to. So, uh, Wendy Kramer wrote in her book, one of her books, that there's this guy called Francisco Lopez was also natural from Palma the the, the, the old day, right? Well, you find the Francisco Lopez in Panama, moving from Panama to Nicaragua, and there's a Francisco Lopez Portuguese in Honduras at the same time when Juan Rodriguez Portuguese is there and Carrillo is there. I'm not entirely sure because so, you think Juan Rodriguez is common? Francisco Lopez. <laughs> There are so many of that it's very difficult to disintegrate who was who, who went from here to there with whom at what time. But if we could understand how this Francisco Lopes got naturalized or his real Spanish in Paula del Rio and how he ends up in Nicaragua, how he ends up in Honduras, but as Francisco Lopes Portuguese, that would be interesting, right? Because if this Francisco Lopes is the same as this Francisco Lopes Portuguese, also naturalized in Palma del Rio, and he shows up together with Cabrillo, maybe we could understand how Cabrillo ended up. In Finally, last slide, people, we can go in more. <laughs> the Testament of Cabrillo. Okay, so uh, <coughs> when Cabrillo died, um, Bartolome Ferner continued the, the, the navigation, as you know. And uh, in October 1543, Ferner asked the Viceroy of Spain uh, permission to bring some slaves uh, to do trade with Peru. In the same set of documents, he also complained to the Viceroy, saying, hey, uh, I'm Albacea. Albacea is the Castilian word for the, the person who executes the testament, the will of someone who died. So uh, Ferrer is the Albacea, the testament executor of Juan Rodriguez Carrillo, with two R's, Carrillo. And he complains with the Viceroy, saying, hey, this guy called uh, Francisco Hernandez, who is a, a, a caulker, who you know, does the caulking of the ships, he bought uh, properties in a public auction of this Juan Rodriguez, but he doesn't pay. And the viceroy says, hey, uh, to the mayors of Colima, you should make this Francisco Hernandez pay to um, uh, Bartolome Ferrer, who is the real executor of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. And this is the copy she take with you. So uh, Ferrer took a copy, giving him permission to use the slaves, and took a copy, giving him permission to make the guy pay the money. I took the original time, I'm sorry. These are copies. What survived were the copies. And I wouldn't be surprised if whoever copied changed the B by an R. That's one single letter. I searched, there is no one who this Carrillo anywhere. Why would the Viceroy of Spain care about one who this Carrillo? Carrillo would make more sense. Ferrer would make more sense to be the guy who executes the will of Cabrillo. Furthermore, Francisco Hernandez indeed knew Cabrillo in Guatemala. They become names of Guatemala at the same time. Indeed, he owned a bunch of money because of other things he didn't he do. He, he, he was a treasurer. He didn't deliver the money he should. So he was in, in economical problems. So there's a reason for him not to pay uh, for that money. So I think this is the first evidence that Cabrillo had a testament. And I think whoever did the copy of the document, the original went with the 
Fair hair. May have switched one single line. One single letter, I mean. Can read because nobody. Why would the Viceroy and Bartolomeu Bartolomeu ever care about this? On top of it is someone who knew Kabila, etc., etc. Okay? So this is in the archives of Mexico as well. Uh, I, I asked a copy of High Resolution nine months ago. I only have this taken from the screen, but hopefully one day I will get a bit more information. But you may be able to spend our entire lives without knowing anything else. These things are like a, a needle in the haystack. So that's it. Thanks, thanks a lot for your attention. Uh, it was delivered to, uh, assuming this is the case, uh, uh, Ferber must have took it with him because he was the executor of the testament. And he sold in public auction, Almoner, as the Castilian said, he sold in public auction uh, properties of Cabrillo and Kulima. Kulima was the big village near the uh, Navidad harbor. Mm -hmm. And this fellow, Francisco Hernandez, was indeed the mayor or the treasurer in that, in that location. But he moved from Guatemala, Francisco Hernandez Calker moved from Guatemala where he knew Cabrillo, moved to Colima. So it, it makes sense that he would buy property from someone he knew right. before. Mm -hmm. but, but why would the vice roy get involved in some random person? Right. Who cares if you, I mean, there are thousands of people that the vice roy would be involved in someone that just died exploring the with his ships, right? So to me, this is a simple mistake of one letter. Makes way more sense than saying that Antonio Tordesaver was wrong. It's not very ingenious for Kramer and Kelsey to say, oh, now he was born in Palma del Rio, therefore uh, Antonio Tordesaver is wrong. Come on, that's not very industrious, is it? it don't, don't point mistakes to the others just because they're not doing the proper interpretation. Yes, ma'am. So, to finalize your findings, you would say that Cabrillo, or Cabrillo mm -hmm. was born when and where for us to have as a reference? Well, uh, nobody knows. If everyone wants to be in honest, your opinion. in my opinion, the best model, the best answer, that he was born on the Palace of Cabrillo in 1497. Okay. Because again, Kramer work, amazing work, except in the nationality. She, Cabrillo declares that he left with, um, in, in the fleet of Pedrales Dávila in 1514 and he was 17 years old. If you discount 1514 minus 17, he was born in 1497 period. Right? And the crucifix story, the documents of the Rodrigues, again, that's the best model we have, the best data points. It's not the final answer, one must be honest and admit so, but I don't think the Spanish have a better answer either. And again, in my, in my paper, the first part is done. You can see the preprint. I give many examples there of people who got naturalized, but they are not born. That's a very, very important difference. And, and I, I will tell Kramer now and Kels and whoever, and Jesus Benares in particular, look, this doesn't say it's born. Hold on, okay? It says it's natural. It's a different thing. Well, that's even true today. I mean, well, I, I'm, I'm naturalized a U.S. Yes. citizen, but I was born in Portugal. So yeah, I just pulled up a, a, a document in my name that was done this uh, fall in Portugal, and it states that I am natural of, does not say that I was born. Right. Although I was born in the yeah. same city, it says I was natural of. But in some cases, Dalmin was asking, and he was right. Uh, in the case of Bartolomeu Ferrer, he says, I'm natural of Albiswa. Mm -hmm. Why in that case I assume natural means being born? <laughs> in that case, Genoa was not forcing anyone to get naturalized. Right. To go to the new, the new world, you need to be naturalized. Magellan was forced to abandon the Portuguese. America was pussy, Jean de Solis, and so many others. That guy couldn't convince them, look, I'm natural and born. Right, for right. the Barbs could relieve because everyone knew, well, natural, so well, what? As Fidel Nascimento says, natural and born. It says both. Yeah. But other documents doesn't have to state both. That's what I'm yeah. saying. So it can be ambiguous. And that's what we, where a lot of this, you know, this lies. The big issue for people who defend the community with Spanish is that the particular context of the Castile naturalization laws would force many people to get naturalized, right? And so they should read Tamar Erzog, How to Become a Spaniard. Mm -hmm. It was quite, quite, quite common. And so if it is so common, I, I knew that from high school. How come these professional historians, they assume automatically natural therefore, or no, natural therefore nothing. This is bad scholarship. Or if it is ignorance, so if you know, are, is it bad faith? Are you doing it on purpose? You know, but you don't want to address. That's, that's playing well. That's, I prefer to believe they are ignorant than that they're with bad faith in this business. But either way, it doesn't look good on them. And another question, since you're a historian, what, uh, what, what was census? I know that we do the census here, and, and, and I know Portugal did census. Do you know when that started back then? Yeah, my name. Uh, well, uh, they must have started at least in 1500s, because 
At the time of the Portuguese start exploring the world, there was half a million Portuguese on this. Half a million people <laughs> spreading from Brazil to East Timor. That's, uh, that's 20 times less than today. Today, of course, it's 10 million in, in mainland and islands. So imagine 500 years ago, half a million people only spreading across the world, right? So uh, that number exists, so there must have been some sort of census by then, at least. Uh, I'm, yeah. Just a two part question. So, how did they go from the Atlantic to the Pacific through a small river there? And then, what was the main work looking for gold through the history? Oh, uh, you know, pepper and, and uh, clove were as expensive as gold. So, there was the spices. Spices and Christians. I was in Santo Mel Meliapur, which is now Chennai, or Madras, Madras in, in India. The Portuguese found the Christians at St. Thomas. Christianized back then, then Islam came, then they become sort of Hindus. So it, it, they, they found the lost Christians that were separated from. So the, the, the St. Thomas Christians from the Malabar coast, they went back and see the Pope for the first time with, with sand from the, the tumular stone where St. Thomas was buried. Okay. And the Portuguese at the cathedral there until the 1840s of St. Thomas' body, which is now under the, the, the British church. So they were not just searching for gold, they were also searching for Christians, right? In particular, the example of the Christians that the Portuguese found in the east coast of India is quite, it's an epic that needs to be written yet. But how, Some do, you go, how do they go from Atlantic to the Pacific? The Magellan Strait. Okay. The Magellan Strait. Okay. The Magellan Strait, yeah. Um, just to recap, first of all, um, thank you so much for, uh, for your work.